वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर सिक्स ऑफ मॉड्यूल वन ऑफ एडवांस्ड जियो टेक्निकल इंजीनियरिंग सो इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट इंडेक्स प्रॉपर्टीज इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर्स वी हैव अंडरस्टूड अबाउट क्ले पार्टिकल वाटर इंट्रैक्शन एंड डिफरेंट मेथड्स टू डिटरमाइन Uh, clay minerals and sedimentation analysis before introducing sedimentation analysis we also discussed the method for determining gradation of coarse grain particles when you have got a soil which is more than uh, which is having fines more than 12% then we need to do uh, sedimentation analysis or it is also referred as hydrometer analysis so hydrometer analysis is basically used to determine the gradation of uh, fine particles hydrometer is a device which is used to measure the specific gravity of liquids as you see in this slide you have a a, um, a hydrometer with the dimensions in uh, millimeters and uh, it has got a stem and a bulb at the uh, bottom this is used basically to measure the specific gravity of the soil suspension so with this it is possible to measure the the specific gravity from time to time as the soil settles the specific gravity can be assessed for a soil suspension the particles start settling uh, right from the start hence the unit weight of the soil suspension changes from one from time to time so here in this slide as it is as, as it can be seen that this is at the commencement of the test and once the hydrometer is placed then the specific gravity of the suspension is measured after elapsing elapsing a time t2 and again the reading is taken and here you can see that the particles which are actually settled at the base and after certain time t2 t3 and t4 and this uh, situation of the settlement of the particles is shown so measurement of the specific gravity of the soil suspension at a known depth at a particular time provides a point on the grain size distribution curve so here the process of the the sedimentation of the dispersed uh, specimen specimen is shown here when you have got a time t is equal to 0 you have got a suspension and if you have a sampling depth at a depth z from the top surface of the suspension it can be written has in the form of a phase diagram as uh, shown here with uh, total volume 1 and volume of the solids and volume of water and with the weight of water on the right hand side and weight of solids on the right hand side so with this uh, volume of solids is nothing but ws divided by gs gamma w okay and the volume of water which is nothing but 1 minus uh, Uh, you know this total volume that is one uh, this volume of water is nothing but 1 minus vs and substituting here you will get volume of water is equal to 1 minus ws by gs gamma w so uh, the gamma i is nothing but the suspension at any time nothing but weight of w water plus weight of the solids divided by total volume 1 so that is written here as weight of solids plus gamma w vw whole divided by 1 so by substituting for uh, vw you will get the initial unit weight of the uh, uh, unit weight of a unit volume of the suspension gamma i as gamma w plus ws into gs minus 1 divided by gs uh, so this here the gs is nothing but the the specific gravity of the soil solids in the process of the sedimentation of dispersed specimen here at level xx if you assume here the size of the particles which have settled from the surface to the depth z in time td this is from the stokes law when you use we can actually obtain d is equal to square root of 18 mu divided by gs minus 1 into gamma w root over z by td so z is the reference depth where the measurement is being taken so above this level x no particle of size greater than d will be present and in element depth of dz you can see here this is a small element depth above this uh, uh, level xx at a depth z from the su surface of the suspension 
uh, may uh, is assumed that uniform and the particles of the same diameter exist. So, the particles are uh, smaller than d and they actually have a uniform uh, specific gravity it is uh, assumed in that particular elemental uh, distance. If the percentage of the weight of the particles finer than d already sedimented to the original weight of the soil solids in the suspension is say n dash that is if the percentage of the weight of the particles finer than d which are already sedimented to the original weight of the soil solids in the suspension is say n dash then we can actually get the weight of the solids per unit volume of, sus unit volume of suspension at depth z as n dash into w by v where w s is nothing but w by v. Unit weight of the suspension after elapsing a time t d at a depth z is given by from the previous uh, discussion gamma z is equal to gamma w into n dash uh, into w by v into g s minus 1 by g s. So, with this we can actually obtain n dash as g s by g s minus 1 into gamma z uh, minus gamma w into v by w where n dash is in percentage. So, the process of sedimentation uh, with uh, dispersed specimen, but here gamma z is nothing but g s s gamma w, where g s s is nothing but 1 plus r h by 1000 into gamma w, where g s s is the, the specific gravity of the soil specific, uh, uh, suspension, which is nothing but the graduations on the hydrometer. The graduations on the hydrometer generally varies from 0.995 to 1.030 over a length of the stem. So, R h is the reading on the hydrometer what it is noted during the process of experiment. So, n dash is obtained here as g s by g s minus 1 into R h by 1000 into v by w. So, which is simplified further uh, for a volume of say 1000 cc of the soil suspension placed initially uh, we can actually get n dash as g s by g s minus 1 into r h by w, w is nothing but the weight of the solids taken uh, for the dry solids taken for the uh, dispersion analysis or sedimentation analysis. And uh, as we actually keep the hydrometer in the uh, uh, from time to time, uh, it is subjected to it is required to perform immersion corrections. So, in order to calibrate or calibration of the hydrometer uh, for the immersion. Uh, here in this slide there are two figures which are actually shown one is before the immersion of the hydrometer another one is the after immersion of the hydrometer. Before immersion of the hydrometer at level y y is the point at which the measurement is being made that is where the center of the bulb is uh, uh, assumed to be uh, occur or assumed to be there. So, H e is the height uh, from the surface from that the distance from the center of the bulb to the top surface of the uh, soil specimen. And when this, uh, this sur the, the surface the top surface be x x and uh, the surface at which the uh, you know center of the bulb meets is say y y. So, when the bulb is placed uh, there is a raise in the water the raise in the water suspension raise in the water suspension is given by V h by A j because V h is nothing but the volume of the hydrometer, A j is nothing but the area of the jar in which the experiment is being performed. So, here uh, it is assumed that uh, the y y dash y dash y dash which is actually rises above the it is approximated that 50 percent of the uh, V h by A g it will be uh, it will be subjected to a the, the raise the raise is about V h by 2 a g which is about the 50 percent of the raise of that x dash and x dash. So, with that the immersion correction can be obtained like this h e is equal to uh, here h plus h by 2 plus V h by 2 a g the distance minus V h by a g. So, after simplification it is obtained as h plus h by 2 minus V h by 2 a g. So, if it is uh, uh, this uh, immersion correction need to be applied uh, approximately after say 2 to 4 minutes of the uh, you know readings whatever we take. So, the here the uh, we discussed about the calibration of the hydrometer for uh, uh, you know basically for immersion correction. Then the graduations which are actually there 
as I said here from it starts from 0 0.995 to 1.030. Uh, or in the numbers it is R h is equal to 0 or minus 5 to 30. This is these are actually this, uh, graduated uh, uh, indicated on the stem of the hydrometer and h e is the difference where the measurement which, are, which has been uh, taken and these readings which are h e 1 and h e 2 are unique for the hydrometer. So, uh, need to be calibrated and then they vary over linear distance with these readings. Uh, so, the R h conversion of R h into H e is done like this, where R h is equal to G s s minus 1 into 1000. So, the plot of R h uh, with H e is valid for a particular hydrometer. That means, that each hydrometer will have a uh, you know plot for R h and H e. So, with the linear interpolation, if you see up to 2 minutes or 4 minutes, uh, where we do not have any immersion correction. Uh, with that he is equal to he 1 uh, this distance and uh, minus he 1 minus he 2 he 1 minus he 2 divided by 30 into r h this is up to 40, 4 minutes uh, or here he uh, that is beyond four, uh, 4 minutes he 1 minus he 1 minus he 2 by 30 into r h minus v h by 2 a g. So, this is uh, after 4 minutes. So, here uh, it is summarized along with other uh, corrections which are actually required for the uh, you know hydrometer reading, uh, where n dash is equal to g s by g s minus 1 into r by w, uh, w is nothing but the weight of the solids and r is the corrected hydrometer reading uh, which is used in this expression for calculating the percentage and w is the weight of the solids taken for uh, uh, preparing the soil suspension where R is nothing but R h plus C m that is meniscus correction plus or minus C t the temperature correction minus C d. So, n combined that is if you have got a performed a CV analysis and if the percentage of the fines is say more than 12 percent, then the total soil taken for uh, uh, you know gradation that is uh, W t and uh, total soil passing 75 micron in a given soil mass which is taken for sieve analysis and uh, n combined can be obtained by getting n dash uh, by using g s by g s minus 1 into r by w and then putting substituting in uh, n combined is equal to n dash by uh, into w 75 divided by w t you will be able to get the n combined. So, with that percentage uh, the finer and the particle size variation can be plotted. And uh, where W 75 is nothing but the weight of the soil fraction passing 75 micron, W t is nothing but the total weight of the soil skeleton for uh, combined sieve and hydrometer analysis. So, in the hydrometer corrections apart from meniscus correction, C m which is a meniscus correction which is applied always positive because the density readings increase downwards that is that the suspension or the hydrometer readings increase downwards. So, because of that the meniscus correction is always positive. C t uh, it is positive for temperature greater than 27 degrees. So, R h will be less than what it should be. So, the reading will be less than what it should be. So, because of that the, uh, the temperature correction is positive if the temperature is room temperature is more than 27 degrees negative for T less than 27 degrees R h will be more than what it should be. So, because of this uh, it is higher. So, what it is done is that the uh, temperature correction is done negative and uh, C d is always negative because in order to uh, you know prevent flocking of the soil particles uh, while preparing the suspension the dispersion agent is used like sodium carbonate or sodium oxalate are used to deflock the soil. So, dispersion as in con uh, concentration uh, you know uh, to, co to account for that the dispersion correction is always negative. So, let us see uh, after having discussed the procedure let us see uh, an example of for the hydrometer analysis with uh, a particular soil kaolin passing uh, 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 very fine kaolin, uh, kaolin uh, soil. So, here the volume of the suspension is uh, 1000 ml and the volume of the hydrometer is uh, 
uh, which is taken for the test is about 90 cc and the weight of the dry soil taken is about 50 grams and the specific gravity of the soil is about 2.62. The cross section area of the jar is AJ about 31 centimeter square and room temperature is 27 degrees. Um, dispersing agent correction about uh, CM is equal to uh, 0 0.0004, meniscus correction CD is equal to 0 0.0034, temperature correction CT is equal to 0 0.9965 and viscosity of the water taken as 8.545 into 10 to raise to minus 7 kilo Newton second per meter square. With this data, uh, for the given hydrometer that is H E 1 which is nothing here it is indicated as H dash E 1, maximum depth to maximum depth to center of the bulb from R H 0.995 that is the, the topmost reading in the stem of the hydrometer is 21 centimeter. H E 2 uh, that is closer to the center of the bulb, maximum depth to the center of the bulb from, uh, from for R H reading 1.030 is 9 centimeter. Let us say at t at time t is equal to 2 minutes after placing the suspension and the reading which is actually taken in the hydrometer is say 28.5 which is uh, indicates that R h is equal to 1.0285. Since H dash E varies linearly with uh, R h uh, the uh, by using this uh, presumption and the diameter of the soil particle is actually calculated by using uh, 1000 into 1 1.8 mu divided by g or g s minus 1 into square root over h e 98 into 60 into t that is uh, the time at which the uh, you know the reading is being taken and percentage finer n is equal to g by g minus 1 gamma that is r h plus or minus uh, c that is the summation of all the corrections into uh, 1000 divided by uh, this mass of the solids which is actually taken for suspension. So, here in this uh, slide uh, calculations are given where H e H dash E was obtained based on the hydrometer details where it is obtained as 9.14 and uh, with immersion correction that is V H by 2 A G uh, it, it is obtained as 8.063. Now, substituting in the expression which was uh, shown in the previous uh, slide d is equal to 1000 into 1.8 into 8.545 uh, into 10 to the power of minus 7 divided by the specific gravity minus 1 that is 2.62 minus 1 into root square root of this 8.063 divided by 98 into 60 into 2 which uh, gives a particle size of 0.0255 mm. So, with this you can actually calculate that n dash that is nothing but uh, obtained as about 93 percent. So, based on this for the different timings when the calculations are done for time 0.5 minute 1 minute immersion correction was not taken and 2, 5, 15, 30, 60 and then 120, 14, 40 the with the reading these are the readings which are actually taken and these are the corrected uh, H dash E and then D uh, in particle size in millimeter. So, once we plot this uh, the particle size on the log semi log logarithmic scale and the percentage finer on the uh, y axis will get this uh, uh, gradation plot. So, here this is the percentage finer on the y axis and particle size on the x axis with this is possible that you will be able to see the percentage points. Here in this particular uh, kaolin soil what has been taken the silt particles are about 44 percent and clay particles are about 56 percent. That means, that is basically a silty clay having a, a clay fraction about uh, 56 percent and silt fraction about uh, uh, 44 percent and the 100 percent fine fractions. So, limitations we have used the Stokes law for calculating uh, uh, you know the uh, coming uh, arriving at the particle size distribution of fine grained soils. However, we knew that the clay particles are hardly uh, spherical, but they are platelet particles. So, so, the soil particles are not truly spherical and uh, the sedimentation is done in a jar uh, which is actually also induces uh, some sort of uh, limiting uh, boundaries type. So, for d greater than 0.2 mm causes turbulence in water and for d less than 
uh, 0.002 mm the brownian movement occurs so this is actually too small for the velocities of settlement so can be eliminated with uh, less concentration so if you are having a finest uh, fine fractions then it is suggested that uh, very little amount of the soil solids need to be taken particularly for example uh, when we are determining the gradation of a bentonite you should not take uh, about not more than about uh, 5 grams of uh, soil solids also. So, one limitation is that the soil particles are not truly spherical. Other, other formulation is that uh, the flock formation due to inadequate dispersion. Sometimes what will happen is that what we measure is not the true particle size. Uh, this is because of the, the flock formation uh, or inadequate dispersion. An unequal specific gravity of all particles, insignificant for soil particles with fine fraction. So, this is unequal uh, specific gravity of the all particles that is also one uh, it is not it is assumed that all particles are actually having the same specific gravity, but there is a possibility that unequal uh, specific gravity can exist. So, basically though it is uh, insignificant this is actually listed as one of the limitations of Stokes law. So, here in this uh, plot a total uh, uh, particle size distribution curve is actually shown where you have got uh, percentage finer on the y axis on the x axis we have got uh, particle sizes. So, here uh, it is important to know that some particle sizes are actually characterized they are called d 10 as the effective particle size and d 50 as the average particle size. So, here in the d 50 means here the 50 percent of the particles are uh, coarser and 50 percent of the particles are finer and d 10 is the effective particle size which is called in this 10 percent of the particle sizes are finer and 90 percent of the particle uh, 90 percent are actually particles are coarser than that d 10 size. So, we use d 10, d 15, d, d, d 10, d 60, d 30 and for some filter design requirements d 15, d 85 uh, are also used. So, here in this graph where a, a well graded uh, portion of the well graded uh, uh, you know distribution is actually shown and diameter of the soil particles for which 60 per 60 percent of particles are finer that is 60 percent of the particles are finer and 40 percent are coarser than d 60 that is what actually the physical meaning of d suffix 60. So, here um, we use as I said that uh, d 30 can be determined from the graph like this and uh, C u uh, which is called d 60 by d 10. So, in this case for the type of the soil it is obtained as 5.8 uh, and d 60 d 10 which is used to determine the quotient of curvature that is uh, d 30 square divided by d 60 into d 10. So, if the value of the C u is equal to 1 that indicates that all particles are actually having almost identical sizes. So, uh, if the slope of the gradation curve is say very very steep then there is a tendency that all uniform graded uh, particles exist in that particular type of uh, distribution. So, some common use some commonly used measures are the uniformity coefficient which is nothing but the C u is equal to d 60 by d 10 and soils with C u less than 4 are considered to be poorly graded or uniform that is what a steeper curve indicates that uh, you know uh, uniform grade distribution that means that uh, all particles are actually having same size or it is also called as poorly graded. And C u greater than 4 to 6 uh, is called well, gra well graded soil and coefficient of the gradation or curvature is called as C c is equal to d 30 square divided by d 60 into d 10. So, if uh, the c c is equal to uh, 1 to 3. So, if the c u value is say greater than 4 to 6 and uh, c c value is 1 to 3 then the soil is said to be well graded. So, higher the value of c u the larger the range of the particle sizes in the soil. So, higher the value of the uh, c u the larger the range of the particle sizes in the soil. So, typical characteristics of the grain size distribution curves if you look into it as we discuss uh, steep curves uh, uh, are possible with low C u values and they are poorly graded in nature and uniformly graded is also referred. And C u less than 5 indicates that for uniformly graded soils 
and a flat curves um, with mild uh, slopes, the I C U values indicates that well graded soil. So, most gap graded soils have a C C outside the range that is a gap graded soil uh, means that some range of the particle size of the particles will remain absent from the soil matrix. So, uh, the intermediate particle sizes will be absent in gap graded soils. So, most gap graded soils have the C C outside the uh, range. Uh, we can also see that the grain size distribution curves can also give the soils history. In this slide, uh, three different particle size distribution curves are shown. Uh, one is for a the one which is uh, on this side is for a young residual soil deposit and here for the intermediate maturing soil deposit and here is fully maturing soil deposit. As can be seen here, uh, a residual soil deposit has its particle sizes constantly changing with time as the particles continue to break down. So, in the process of uh, weathering the particles uh, subjected to gradation is subjected to change. So, we can say that the grain size distribution can provide an indication of soils history. And uh, typically we also discussed it that the soils get transported from one, age, uh, one place to other place and then they are called as transported soils with different agencies. And uh, here we have got a typical grain size distribution for glacial and glacial and alluvial soil deposits. Here uh, this particular uh, figure which is actually shown for the percentage spinner on the y axis and particle size on the x axis is for a glacial soil deposit and this one is the glacial and alluvial soil deposit. So, river deposits basically have well graded and uniform or gap graded uh, uh, depending upon the water velocity and the volume of the suspended solids and the river area where the deposition is occurring. So, here in this uh, slide uh, you know number of different types of uh, uh, you know grain size distribution curves are shown and as can be seen here on the uh, this particular portion where a gravelly sand uh, you know particle size distribution is shown and here a silty and with a fine sand mixture is shown here and here there is a clay and fine sand uh, clay, clay and sandy silt soil is shown here. Then here two types of uh, you know one is the flocculated uh, kaolinite, other one is the dispersed kaolinite and the sodium bentonite which is finest of the finest of all where you can see the finer, finer uh, fraction the particles are very very small. So, as we go from this side to this side the particle size uh, diminishes and uh, you have got different uh, you know for example, you have got flocculated and dispersed uh, have got the here where there is dispersions are the uh, between repulsions are very predominant and here there is a possibility of uh, uh, flocculation. So, the flocculated kaolinite actually has got this type of distribution and dispersed kaolinite has actually got this type of distribution and here the sodium mantomolinite based soil actually has got uh, a distribution which is actually shown here. And uh, particle size distribution of bentonite and illite and kaolinite if you consider uh, as we discussed in the previous slide, the sodium bentonite or sodium based mantomal light has got the finer uh, very, has got very very small fractions of uh, size. And when you compare uh, these three minerals, the kaolinite soil is, soil is relatively coarser and comes in between is illite and uh, then followed just finer is the bentonite. So, if you have the typical gradation then it is possible for us to estimate what is the percentage gravel and what is the percentage sand and what is the percentage silt and percentage clay. So, sometimes if you have got uh, say percentage clay it is possible for us to once we know the index properties of the soil it is possible whether the soil is active or not can be estimated. So, in this curve for the given example here you have the uh, uh, the typical grain size distribution and the coarser particles is on this side that is gravel, sand, silt and clay. And here the percentage gravel uh, which is more than 4.75 is found to be 0 and the sand size is from uh, uh, from this side to the 
uh, size of the silt that is 0 0.075 mm, where 100 minus 60 that is 40 percent is actually sand and the silt is from this uh, percentage that is 60 percent minus up to this uh, 12 percent that is clay fraction where it is coming that is uh, uh, 48 percent and the clay fraction is about 12 percent. So, that means that this particular soil actually has got about 60 percent as percentage points that is passing 200 mm C. So, in this example problem which is actually shown in this slide, we need to determine percentage of the gravel uh, and the sand silt. So, gravel is indicated as G, sand is indicated as S and silt is indicated as M and clay as C for soils A, B and C. So, the, the three typical grain size distribution which are actually shown here, one is that the poorly graded sand and here this is uh, uh, well graded silty sand and here well, well graded sandy silt. So, if you look into this here, the soil A which is actually has got 2 percent gravel, the gravel is uh, uh, very less, the 2 percent fraction is here and then followed by 98 percent sand and the curve is actually asymptotic here and the 0 percent silt and 0 percent clay. Hence, here this is nothing but a poorly graded sand. In this case, it is a well graded silty sand where it has actually got 61 percent of silt particles, uh, sand particles and 31 percent uh, silt and 7 percent clay. So, this is actually referred as well graded silty sand and if you look into this, this actually has got contrast, it actually has got silt particles higher. So, we call it well graded sandy silt where 57 percent silt particles and 31 percent sand exist there. So, some applications of the having determined the particle size distribution, uh, we can actually discuss where the grain size uh, distribution or analysis can be used, particularly uh, in geotechnical, geotechnology and in construction. Basically, very much useful in the selection of the fill material, particularly has arting material or casing material, it is required uh, for embankment and at the dam construction. And as a road sub base material, uh, basically the well graded soils are preferred and for the drainage filters in order to allow and uh, retain the finer fraction, the filters are required. And the ground water drainage and grouting and chemical injection where the fraction of the soil which is actually required to be mentioned and concreting materials and in the dynamic compaction is the process where the soil can be densified by dropping uh, weights from the known heights. The practical significance of the grain size distribution uh, can be uh, you know discussed like this. Uh, grain size distribution of soil smaller than 75 micron or 0.075 mm is of little importance uh, in the solution of engineering problems but GSDs larger than 75 micron have several important uses. Particularly if you look into this, GSD affects the void ratio of the soils and provides useful information for use in cement and asphalt concretes, particularly during the pavement constructions. Well graded aggregates require less cement because they have got less void spaces and if you have got uh, uniformly graded uh, uh, aggregates, then it requires more cement and it tends to become uh, uneconomical and then less load bearing. So, well graded aggregates require less cement uh, per unit volume of concrete to produce denser concrete and it is less permeable and more resistance to resistant to weathering. Secondly, a knowledge of the amount of the percentage of the fines and uh, gradation of the coarse particles is useful in making a choice of material in base courses under highways, runways and rail tracks etcetera. And as I said before, if you know the percentage clay fraction, whether the clay is active um, from the expansiveness point of view, whether the soil is expansive or not can be uh, established by with a term called activity. So, activity of the clay is based on the percentage of the uh, clay fraction. And uh, another significance of grain size distribution is that to design filters. Basically, filters are used to uh, control the seepage and the pores must be small enough to prevent particles from being carried from the edge sand soil or the base soil which is called. So, after having discussed you know grain size distribution and in order to complete 
uh, or in order to arrive at the uh, knowledge for classifying the soils or grouping the soil, we need to understand particularly as far as the fine grained soils is concerned, the different possible physical states of the fine grained soils. As the soil water content changes, soil changes from different states from liquid state to plastic state to semi solid state to solid state. That is as the soil is subjected to drying, soil changes from liquid, liquid state to plastic state to semi solid to solid states. For the most of the soil deposits which are reasonably compressed can occur at this particular uh, water content that is at this point where the, the they are actually close to plastic state or the this particular uh, limiting water content. So, we actually need to have uh, understand about the uh, uh, you know these uh, transitions between liquid limit and liquid state and plastic state and plastic state and semi solid state and semi solid state and solid state. So, before discussing about that we need to understand about the what is the term called consistency, consistency of the fine grained soils. So, basically it is a property of a material which is manifested by its resistance to flow. It represents the relative ease with which the soil may be deformed. So, if the soil is uh, very stiff then it is uh, difficult to uh, get it deformed. So, degree of the firmness of a soil and is often directly related to its strength. It is conveniently described as soft, medium, stiff, medium firm, stiff or firm or very stiff. And these terms are unfortunately are relative and have different meaning to different observers. So, the consistency is defined as the property of a material which is manifested uh, by its resistance to flow and it represents the real two ease with which the soil may be deformed. In soil mechanics basically it is required to determine the range of the potential behavior of a given soil tape based on only few simple tests. Uh, soils might uh, shrink or expand excessively in an uncontrolled manner after they have been placed in geotechnical structures. That means, that once the soils actually have been used for constructing structures like roadway embankments or roadway subgrades, dams, levees, foundation materials, they can be subjected to depending upon the type of the mineral, they can be subjected to shrinking or you know, you know expanding. So, soils make lose their strength and ability to carry loads safely. So, the consistency basically here of the you know, when we are discussing about the fine grained soils, the test used to detect potential problems for coarse grained soils. Uh, are different from the used to detect from the potential problems for the fine grained soils. That is silt and clay, it has to be noted the test which are actually used to detect potential problems for coarse grained soils are different from fine grained soils. In coarse grained soils water content generally is not a major factor and major factor leading to shrinkage is structure of the soil skeleton. And in case of fine grained soils water content is a major factor and soil expand and lose strength and soil shrink and gain strength. So, if the water content of a clay soil is gradually reduced by a, a desiccation natural process, the clay passes from a liquid state to plastic state as I discussed earlier and finally, into a, a solid state. So, the water content at which, at which the different clays, clays passes from one, one state to other state is very important and this is unique to a particular type of a soil. So, water content at these transitions can be used for identification and composition of different clays. So, it has been thought that uh, in order to uh, you know classify or uh, determine the index properties, uh, it is required to determine water contents at these transitions can, can be determined uh, for identification and comparison of the different clays or different fine grained soils. So, here these limits are called at uh, they are called Atterberg limits. Uh, or the water contents where the soil behavior changes from one, one when they change from one state to other state. So, here the, in this slide the soil moisture scale is shown where is this is the physical state liquid and here is the consistency and is liquid, liquid state and liquid. Uh, so, at this point the transition between this uh, liquid state to plastic state is determined or in, uh, called as liquid limit and above this the soil is like a liquid, it is called very soft and uh, plastic 
that is between liquid limit and plastic limit. So, the plastic limit is the another type of Atterberg limit which is a transition between plastic state and semi solid state and in this nature in this the natural soil deposits they do occur at this particular water content and uh, shrinkage limit which is a transition between semi solid state to solid state in the extremely strict. So, up to if you see that the degree of saturation which is nothing but the uh, volume of water in the volume of voids. So, here up till here the 100 percent saturation is ensured and beyond this state the soil is no longer uh, fully saturated and uh, big, it tends to become uh, air starts entering here. So, liquid limit, plastic limit and shrinkage limit are the three uh, Atterberg limits what uh, we are going to discuss. So, here when the soil changes from one uh, now, when, when transits from these physical states the finally the it can actually changes into this type of uh, solid state. So, if you look into if you connect to the uh, you know specific surface areas and electric electrical charges. So, it was discussed that for fine trade soils we have uh, discussed that uh, they have high specific surface areas and the electrical charges are very predominant on their particles. So, because of this the fine grained soils and clays in particular can change their consistency quite dramatically with changes in water content. So, why the particularly clays uh, change uh, you know the consistency from one water content one state to other state is the reason is that because of the high specific surface area and the prevalent uh, electrical charges. And each soil type will generally have different water contents at which it behaves like a solid, semi solid, plastic, liquid. For a given soil the water content that mark the boundaries between the soil are called or defined as Atterberg limits. So, it is pictorially it is uh, indicated here and this particular state is uh, liquid limit and this is plastic limit and this particular state uh, this what this water content uh, at this transition between semi solid and solid state is Atterberg, Atterberg limits. So, Atterberg limits are nothing but the water contents where the soil behavior changes. So, here in this uh, particular slide uh, where the volume of the uh, volume is plotted on the y axis and water content is plotted on the volume of the sample on the y axis and volume of water content on the x axis. So, this particular line which is uh, inclined at 45 degrees it can be seen here that at point A that is uh, a point where the initial uh, water content, but when it uh, transits from liquid state to plastic state that is the point B that is referenced here as the liquid limit W suffix L and uh, point C is the plastic limit that is transition between plastic state to semi solid state. And, but when it transits from semi solid state to solid state up till this point the water content is 100 percent the, the, the degree of saturation is 100 percent and this water content uh, this water content at this particular state of transition between semi solid state to solid state is called as shrinkage limit. But beyond this point if you look into this if you magnify here that there is a possibility that the air entry this curvilinear nature of this curve uh, which indicates that here uh, the air which is actually enters into the voids and uh, the soils will no longer get uh, compressed and the no volume change will happen. So, this is nothing but the volume of air plus volume of the solids. So, this is the volume remains the, the solid volume remains constant upon further drying. So, this V d is nothing but the volume of air plus volume of solids and V naught is nothing but the original volume at point A. So, one if you define uh, uh, you know these Atterberg limits. Uh, the first limit which is called liquid limit is the water content at which a soil is particularly in, uh, is practically in a liquid state, but has infinitesimal resistance against the flow and which is actually possesses a strength and uh, it is said that the soils possess about uh, strength uh, from 1.7 to 2.7 uh, kilo Newton per meter square or kilo Pascals. The plastic limit is the water content at which the soil would just begin to crumble when rolled into threads of approximately 3 mm diameter. So, uh, this is a limit at which the soil will start crumbling into uh, uh, crumbling when rolled into the threads of approximately 3 mm diameter. Suppose, if the soil is uh, having sandy particles and uh, with a little amount of fine fraction 
you very difficult to make threads. So, that indicates that the soil is non-plastic. Shrinkage limit is the water content at which a decrease in water content does not cause any decrease in the volume of the soil mass. So, at shrinkage limit the degree of saturation is 1. In this particular slide an attempt is being made to explain about the shrinkage phenomenon. So, here this is the solid particle which is uh, indicated with the HS here and uh, this is uh, you know water surface uh, when it actually transiting from semi solid state to solid state. Assume that R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4, R 5 are the radii of this minuscule water minuscule between the particles and if you look into this the radius of R 1 is actually very high R 2, R 3, R 4, R 5. Uh, so, uh, as it uh, proceeds uh, the minuscule uh, radii is decreasing and then here also same, same situation is shown. So, this is the idealized section uh, at the process at which where the curvilinear portion where air starts entering. So, here imagine a compressible soil containing tiny grains with capillary pore spaces between the grains. So, the mechanism is actually explained like this. Uh, when the pore spaces are completely filled with water, there is a free water on the surface of the soil, the meniscus is, uh, is a plane surface that is uh, with R 1 radii and the tension in the water is 0. That means, that the water is not exerting any tension on the soil particles, but as the evaporation removes the water from the surface, a meniscus begins to form and e each of the pores at the surface with a resulting tension in water. So, at some time after evaporation has started the minuscule would have reduced it to some position say 2 uh, that is uh, from position 1 to position 2. At this stage the tension in the water is 2 T s by R 2. So, if you look into this uh, R 2 is smaller than R 1. So, the tension in the water is, uh, increases. The soil is compressed by the stress equivalent to 2 T s by R 2. So, as this process uh, uh, continues the what happens is that it is something like the particles are pushed or pulled towards closer and the tension in water T w can be estimated by equating the tensile forces in the water to the vertical components of the surface tension force. With that we can actually calculate T w is equal to 2 T s by R 2. So, as the further evaporation continues the fully developed meniscus in the largest pore space recedes to a, a smallest uh, diameter. So, this uh, makes the particles to come closer uh, and then uh, to such a state that the particles will could no longer be get uh, you know compressed into the further. So, this produced uh, produces an increased sigma dash and causes uh, further increase. So, as the evaporation process uh, actually goes on the minuscule keeps on tending to become sharp with that the tension in the water continues to increase and because of this uh, the fully developed meniscus in the largest pore space recedes to a the smaller diameter which brings or pulls the particles to the closer uh, distance. So, this explains uh, the typical shrinkage phenomenon we actually experience in uh, typical so fine grained soils. As the evaporation continues the minuscule continue to recede and the tension in the water continue to increase and the compression between the soil grains and the resultant shrinkage continues to increase. So, eventually what will happen is that the minuscule will reach the smallest uh, radius that is what we were discussed uh, previously. By the time minuscule reduced to the least possible radius, uh, the pores in soil will not be there to compress. That means, that most of the compression uh, which is uh, possible uh, is might have already happened. So, hence this explains the shrinkage phenomenon. So, the Etterberg limits uh, basically provide a good deal of information on the range of the potential behavior of the given soil which might show in the field and variations in the water content. So, uh, if you look into this the soils actually have uh, got in a solid state and semi solid state and plastic state and liquid state. In the semi solid state or in case of in the solid state the soil uh, is uh, very stiff in nature and has got a, a, a so called a, a brittle behavior. And in case of a semi solid state the soil has combined brittle and ductile behavior like a stiff cheese. In case between uh, in the plastic state soil is very ductile, soil is very ductile is something like a malleable type behavior. And uh, here in the liquid state but that is actually beyond this or at this particular point. 
soil behaves like a thick or a thin viscous fluid. So, soil is something like a, a viscous fluid here. So, here the, the stress strain variation that is sigma is in this direction and epsilon is the strain in the axial direction is actually shown here. So, here the plasticity index which is defined as uh, nothing but the difference of the uh, liquid limit minus plastic limit. It is the range of the moisture content over which the soil exhibits plasticity. It is the range of the moisture content or water content, content of a soil uh, which uh, exhibits plasticity. So, plasticity is defined as the property of a material which it allows it to deform rapidly without rupture. So, greater the difference between the liquid limit and plastic limit, the more is the plasticity of the soil. Uh, the mesh, uh, this particular uh, uh, you know clay particles which are actually shown there, where you have got the uh, water uh, water droplets uh, attached to the clay clay negative particle sizes, and uh, we have discussed that this forms like a adsorbed layer, and the cations which are actually present in the particles are also attracted towards uh, the uh, negative charges here. So this means that the range of water contents over which a given soil can pull water its macro structure assimilate it and still acts like a solid. So, clay soils generally with high specific surface areas and the charged particles will be able to hold large amount of water between the particles due to their uh, charge field and the poor nature of uh, polar nature of the water molecules. And uh, why soils actually have higher pH and uh, you know smaller pH if you look into this. Clay soils with high specific surface area and charged surfaces are viable to bind assimilate water molecules and then overall soil will still behave as a plastic solid and such soils will have higher PIs and soils comparatively the lower uh, specific surface areas will not be able to bind or assimilate water molecules and thus will have smaller plasticity index values. So, uh, for embankment, embankment dam correction, uh, construction if we required to have say a harting zone where we wanted to prevent the water seepage entering into the to retain the water in the reservoir or the dam, then we need a harting which actually has got uh, higher uh, plasticity. For certain type of constructions uh, where the low plastic soils are required. So, soils with comparatively lower specific surface area will not be able to bind or assimilate water molecules and thus they have actually low plasticity indexes. So, in this uh, particular uh, uh, lecture uh, number 6, we actually have understood about uh, uh, the particular in the form of index properties, how to perform a gradation for the fine sand particles and then we discussed about the different possible uh, water uh, the soil states when it is actually changing from uh, liquid state to the solid state and uh, introduced the Atterberg limits like liquid limit, plastic limit uh, and uh, shrinkage limit. And the difference of liquid limit and plastic limit is said as uh, uh, plasticity index. And uh, we, by knowing uh, these things, and then we can, if you can extend further, then we'll be able to classify the soil. So in the next lecture, we'll look into the soil classification and the remaining discussion about the uh, you know about uh, uh, plasticity index and the determination of the liquid limit uh, and other uh, shrinkage limit uh, with some modern method methods, etc.